After the Second World War, Cunard superliners RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth had transported over 1,250,000 troops together, sailing over 930,000 miles, or the same distance as 38 voyages around the Earth. This stunned the United States, whose largest liner, the SS America, had only transported 350,000 soldiers during the war, which, while being incredibly impressive for a ship of her size, would not cut it in other wars where the United Kingdom might not have the ability to use its resources to transport United States troops. At the same time, the SS America finally entered transatlantic service for the United States lines in 1946. However, while she was very modern for her time, she was pitifully small and slow compared to Canard's Queens. So, both the United States lines and the United States government wanted a liner that could stack up to the Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. So over this, they hired Gibson Cox. William Francis Gibbs had been working on his dream ship, as he called it, since the early 1900s, his first designs being completed in 1913. However, because of the outbreak of the First World War, these designs were never built. Despite this, he kept his dream of building the largest United States-owned liner ever, and the fastest liner ever, in the back of his mind, slowly developing a design for it over time. But now, things had changed. A design that he had been working on since 1943 could actually be built. He kept developing this design, called Design 12201. It was incredibly radical for its time, calling for two massive funnels like his previous ship, the SS America. It was also to be the largest commercial ship built in the United States. On top of this, it was also to be the fastest liner of all time. Sometime in the late 1940s, a 20-foot wooden model was constructed to determine the best hull shape possible for the liner. And over time, Thousands of tests were conducted under the watchful eye of Gibbs, with small adjustments each time, until eventually, it was thought that the hull shape could not get any better. Finally, Frederick Gibbs, William Francis Gibbs' brother, estimated the design cost approximately 50 million United States dollars at the time, almost twice what the United States lines could afford. And this is where the United States government came in. They would pay most of the liner's cost, but in exchange, this design would have to follow set requirements. Because of this, the cost ended up being closer to 75 million United States dollars at the time, 50 million of which would be paid by the United States government, while the other 25 million would be paid by our future operators, the United States lines. The requirements put upon Gibbs and Cox for the liner were incredibly stringent, with the main three points being, one, the ship had to be convertible from civilian liner to troop ship in less than 48 hours, two, the ship had to be almost entirely fireproof, and three, the ship had to be built the United States Navy regulations. However, Gibbs and Cox prevailed, and by 1949, thousands of plans had been created by United States Army draftsmen, documenting things such as structural steelwork, rivet placement, paint colors, and more. Among these was 365 frames, a frame being a cross-sectional section of a ship. These 365 frames would then form the backbone of the liner when she was built. During this time, the first full-scale models were being built to show off to the public, and people were beyond ecstatic. The ship generated huge fanfare from all across the world, mainly from her homeland, the United States. Newspapers began publishing about the ship, and now shipyards began bidding to build the design. By May of 1949, a winner was chosen, the winner being Newport News Shipbuilding, Virginia. They selected Dry Dock No. 10 to build the ship. The dry dock was only 960 feet in length and just over 35 feet in depth, so the ship would barely fit, with about 15 feet on either side hanging over the ends of the dry dock. However, the 990-foot liner did indeed fit, and construction began. The keel of Hull 488 was laid down on February 8, 1950 in Newport News Shipbuilding, Virginia marking the start of construction on the radical new liner. Everything about her was modern, including her construction. Not only was she built in dry dock, but she was also built with 180,000 prefabricated sections. Workers would use one of the thousands of plans to make a section of plating shaped to perfection under Gibbs' supervision. This plate would then be attached by welding or riveting to the ship's structure. This process would then be repeated over and over until 16 months later, on June 23, 1951, the ship was ready to be launched. All was not well during the 16 months, though. 
The Korean War started on June 25, 1950, and because of this, the United States government sent a letter to the United States Lines, stating that they would requisition the ship when it was done to transport troops to Korea. Understandably, the Gibbs brothers were devastated by this, and it seemed that, no matter how hard they try, war would always get in the way of their projects, and that now, things would be no different. However, they lucked out when the United States government opted to only requisition three American President Lines liners, the SS Beret, the SS Geiger, and the SS Upshur, thus leaving the United States to enter passenger service when completed. Finally, on June 23, 1951, a crowd of over 15,000 people arrived to watch the launch of the Superliner. In this crowd was William Francis Gibbs and his brother Frederick Gibbs. Together, they watched their creation, many decades in the making, be towed away from them by eight carefully positioned tugs. It is even said that during this, Frederick Gibbs shed a single tear. The ship then went to another dock in Newport New Shipbuilding to be fitted out with her incredible technology, which is what would help set her apart from the competition. She would spend about 12 months here, having electricity be run, air conditioning be set up, and rooms be furnished, including 40 public rooms and over 700 staterooms. Under Gibbs's watch, the ship would go through her builder's trials, testing to see if the ship met her requirements, which she definitely did. Plowing through the slightly stormy seas at a top speed of 43 knots and beyond forward, and going over 20 knots in reverse. On top of this, the ship was also able to stop in just over a mile, which was previously thought impossible for a ship of her speed. Finally, the ship was delivered to United States Lines on June 20th, 1952, and after a second set of sea trials, the ship was sent to New York for people to take $1 tours of the ship, with lines as long as 14 blocks. But it was worth it, because what they would have seen and experienced was unlike anything else previously seen on a passenger ship. She was ultra-modern, featuring five full acres of deck space. She had full air conditioning, with adjustable temperatures in every cabin. She also had telephones in every cabin that can make calls to over 5,000 miles in any direction. Her superstructure is made of aluminum to save weight, weighing one ton for every 1.1 gross register tons in volume, compared to the Queen Elizabeth ratio of one ton per less than one gross register ton in volume. The ship was also so fast that wind blockers had to be installed to stop people from being blown over on long outdoor areas. And it was even said by some of her crew that during her sea trials, she was going so fast standing on her forecastle was equivalent to being punched in the face, just with the wind instead of somebody's hand. She had two movie theaters, with her main one being among the largest afloat, and one of the few dedicated theaters on a liner of her size. Her interior design was also ultra-modern, with most furniture seeming bare to the 48 hours or less conversion restriction. However, despite this, her interiors were incredibly luxurious, and most people loving the design of the interiors. On top of this, she was incredibly safe, arguably the safest liner of all time. Gibbs took the fireproof restriction to a whole nother level, not only making her mostly fireproof, but entirely fireproof. The only wood aboard the ship was her propeller bossings, cutting blocks, and her grand piano, which was made with a rare fire-resistance mahogany, which was only because Steinway refused to make an aluminum grand piano. William Francis Gibbs was so dead set on making his ship entirely fireproof that he made a mock-up of one of her cabins and lit it on fire with fake passenger belongings inside. Only the belongings burned, and the cabin was entirely unscathed. He even refused to let the ship's captain have a mahogany chair that was gifted to him because it could burn. She also had 22 full-size aluminum lifeboats plus two cutter boats. These could carry her entire passenger and crew capacity. On top of this, she had enough life wrap so that in the case of the ship rolling and half the lifeboats being unusable, like on Lusitania or Andrea Doria, everyone could aboard could be saved. All of these combined gave her space for 4,060 people to be saved. But Gibbs was sure these would never have to be used because he was going to make this ship as close to unsinkable as any ship had ever been before. She had 20 watertight compartments and 65 watertight doors. All of these doors could be closed from the bridge, and if power failed, all of them could be closed manually from two locations. One, from right next to the door, and two, from higher in the ship, in case people fled before they could be closed. Finally, the ship was not only fast, but huge. At 990 feet in length and 101.5 feet in width, and 53,300 gross registered tons in volume, she is the largest commercial ship to ever be built in the United States, being just barely small enough to fit in the Panama Canal. On top of this, her striking supersized funnels were over 65 feet in height, or almost as tall as a six-story building. These, among many others, made her the safest, most modern, and advanced liner of her time, and would set her apart from all the other competition.
On July 3, 1952, a massive crowd gathered to see their new flagship leave New York on her maiden voyage. And with a spectacular cheer, the ship was pulled away by tugs to begin her record-breaking voyage. During this voyage, many events happened, and the main ones in chronological order are On July 3rd, the RMS Mauritania II passes the United States as they are leaving, sending a message, Godspeed to you and all aboard you. July 4th, Independence Day celebrations were held aboard the ship. July 5th, SS United States is passed by the French line Liberté, formerly the German Blue Ribbon holder, at Holpa, heading westbound. July 6th, crowds line the decks of both the SS United States going eastbound and her running mate, the SS America, going westbound, as the two pass each other. On July 5th through July 7th, a fog would set in, and the ship would have to race through a storm to keep the record. On July 6th, the SS United States is passed by the RMS Queen Mary at a distance of approximately 11 miles. Passengers on the Queen Mary line the decks to get a good look at the new liner. On top of this, the captain of the Queen Mary, Harry Gradage, sent a message to the United States, saying, Welcome to the family of big liners on the Atlantic. July 7th, an engineer logs the ship, hitting 165.5 rotations per minute on her turbines. She also hits her highest speed ever hit during her career, 36.17 knots. July 7th, after three days, 10 hours, and 40 minutes, the ship passes Bishop Rock at 5.16 a.m. A huge party had been brewing all night and into the morning, and the national anthem was played by the ship's band as the ship blew its whistle three times, marking her smashing of the Queen Mary's record by over 10 hours. The ship sailed in, into La Havre, needing part of her bow to be repainted due to the water blasting her paint off at high speeds. She also passed the British aircraft carrier Indomitable, whose crew saluted the ship. She was then escorted by a United States Navy destroyer across the English Channel to Southampton, where she docked near the Queen Elizabeth. Luckily, their captains were friends, so there were no hard feelings. The ship sailed back into New York on July 14, 1952, after winning the Blue Ribbon both ways. To signify this, she flew a 40-foot, long, dark blue pennant from her radar mast. The record she set would never be topped by any ocean liner ever again. After this, she settled into a regular five-day schedule with her running mate, the SS America. The United States would end up sailing exactly 400 voyages, doing 800 transatlantic crossings. During this time, multiple notable events happened. During a fire drill, a lifeboat release lever was pulled prematurely, dropping lifeboat number 24 over 65 feet from the sun deck into the water. Out of the six people aboard the boat, five were injured and one died in the hospital. In 1964, on her 263rd voyage, the ship was docked by Commodore John Anderson without tug assistance due to the worker strike, resulting in the snapping of a hawser pipe. Again, on voyage number 264, Commodore John Anderson was faced with this issue. He had to dock the ship in a massive snowstorm without tug assistance due to the aforementioned worker strike. Luckily, he was able to skillfully maneuver the United States into Pier 86 once again, this time without damaging the ship. These, plus one time the RMS Queen Mary did the same maneuver, are the only times in history, to my knowledge, that this maneuver was ever successfully performed. Also, during John Anderson's 11-year tenure aboard the SS United States, he was accompanied by his cocker spaniel, Chota Peg. The dog first served with him in 1943 aboard the transport John Erickson. He then sailed on the SS America when John Anderson was in command of her. And finally, when the Commodore transferred to the SS United States, the dog came with him. He was the unofficial first mate of the liner and was very friendly, and while stormy seas did make him nervous, he stayed aboard the ship until he died in 1958. Being buried at sea with full honors, he ended up logging over 2 million nautical miles in his lifetime. Finally, during John Anderson's career aboard the ship on December 14, 1959, the ship's Nahavo room was selected to house 24 orphans during Christmas as part of Project Santa Claus. They would be fed, given gifts, and treated well during their time aboard the ship. The SS United States also did cruises, often sailing to exotic destinations like Cape Town or Nassau. She had the distinct advantage of being able to traverse the Panama Canal, which allowed her to sail on cruises in the Pacific and Atlantic without taking the long and dangerous route around South America. During this time, she also had a temporary outdoor pool installed on her aft decks, which added to her many luxuries that made her surprisingly good at cruising for the time. The United States also spent her career being a total bro to the other ships in the Atlantic, saving many people during her career, 
and using her speed to her advantage, she could arrive to, at distress calls faster than any other passenger ship afloat. Some of her rescues are, on the 21st of September, 1957, during voyage 118, the United States got a distress call from the Coast Guard cutter USCGC Ingham after a crew member named Stephen Long contracted appendicitis. The ship being the closest thing available with a hospital good enough to operate on Stephen, diverted and sped up to 35 knots to rendezvous with the cutter. After arriving on scene, a lifeboat was lowered to collect the man, and after picking him up, the ship continued on her voyage while surgery was conducted to save the man's life. Side note, the Ingham actually still exists today as a museum in the Florida Keys, so uh, video soon, maybe? Another time, during Voyage 202, on June 20th, 1961, a ship received a distress call from the MV Atlantic Duke to pick up badly injured crew member Jerome Takis Stravos, a pump man aboard the ship. The United States turned 180 degrees and sailed at 33 knots to the ship, arriving in just over three hours later to pick up the crewman. Finally, during Voyage 227 on July 8, 1962, she picked up an urgent distress call from a British yacht called Ramona Sea, whose captain had been injured by a swinging boom. The ship sped up to over 35 knots and arrived on scene approximately six hours later. She was stopped and lifeboat number three was lowered to recover the injured man. There were also multiple other notable events from her life, including a time where she was involved in a heist where upwards of 40,000 United States dollars was stolen from her purser's office, or when the RMS Queen Mary narrowly missed the United States' stern by 30 feet while crossing behind the undocking liner. The ship was also once dragged 200 yards after an 83 mile per hour southwesterly crosswind caught her massive funnels. Eventually, the ship was stopped by tugs before she was able to do any significant damage to herself or anything else. Of course, though, despite her incredible speed and her luxury, to the dismay of thousands, the SS United States was retired while she was under her annual inspection and repair. Conducting 400 voyages and 800 Atlantic crossings, she was easily one of the most successful liners of the 20th century, carrying over 1 million passengers in her first 10 years and almost 2 million in her lifetime, sailing over 2 million nautical miles. The ship was then left under the care of the United States government, who didn't want her secret tech getting out, even going as far as to refuse offers to buy the ship, including one from Norwegian Cruise Lines, which would have made her serve alongside her former running mate, the SS France, once again. But. After most of her technology was declassified in 1977, she was finally sold, bouncing around from owner to owner until the SS United States Conservancy bought the ship in 2011. Ever since, she has not been in any major risk of scrapping, and recently, a deal was made with the New York real estate company, RxR, to restore the ship. And as of now, the deal has been signed, and it has been said that the plan has already been put into motion. Now, many videos have been made about the SS United States, so why did I make one? Because I love the ship, and I feel like there's something very special about her that people overlook, hence the title. People often think that all the United States did was be fast, and many consider the ship ugly with bare bones interiors. But that is simply not true. Her history is actually very rich, and while nothing incredibly flashy happened to the ship, like World War I to the Olympic or the Second World War to the Queen Mary, she is special in her own way with many smaller things happening that makes the ship history actually very fun to read about, or in this case, watch videos about. And while I barely scratch the surf surface in this video, I hope to go more in depth in future ones. So until then, stay cool and stay tuned.